Bergs. Fine Belgian gentleman who should know better being drunk by 12 noon. <laughs> Cobbles. Cow poo. That needs some explaining, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I think mean, if you look at the roads in Belgium, they're covered in cow poo. <laughs> the answer. Gray scars. <laughs> That concrete strip down the middle of the road on most oh, Belgian God. roads. The Death Valley. Crosswinds. The smell of beer on the breath of fans when they're there. That's right. We're doing Belgian Bike Race Word Association because today is a holy day. It's Sunday, Easter Sunday, the Tour of Flanders, the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Um, we've had two fascinating bike races. Um, Kasper Asgreen winning in the men's, which was a slight surprise. And Annemiek van Vluten winning in the women's. Maybe not so much of a shock, but we'll go into that. Um, first things first, we're joined by Taylor Wiles, who rides for Trek Sigafredo. Hey, Taylor. Hiya, how are you? All good. Happy Easter. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Just got to watch two exciting bike races, so pretty happy. Sounds good. Um, You've raced the Tour Founders several times, I think. Um, what makes it so different and so special? Uh, it's just such a such a classic race. I think the first time I ever did it was with the national team, and it was one of the first times I'd ever come to Europe. And it's everything you ever imagine as a bike racer, um, all wrapped up in one bike race with you know the epic climbs and cobbled sections that you've heard so much about and amazing fans. I mean, not this year and not last year, but hopefully next year. Um, and it's just, yeah, I remember getting chills the first time I raced it just because um, the history behind the race. And, and there's not a country that loves bike racing more than Belgium. So pretty special. What's been your kind of happiest memory from the Tour of Flanders? Your best memory? <laughs> well, it's funny. The first time I ever did it, um, I was on the national team and and my teammate got second. So that was actually pretty cool to to be a part of that. And um, I was in the, the group that came in that was sprinting for third, but I was so new to the sport that I didn't even know what I was had gotten myself into. So I was just like happily hanging out at the back. Um, but yeah, it's... Every every time I do it, except maybe last year when I crashed spectacularly into a in a ditch of cow poo, um, has been has been a pretty great day. So let's talk about the men's race first, and go on to the women's race. Um, we saw a really attacking race that got whittled down very early. Um, let's start with you, Joe. Kind of what surprised you, kind of the most from this year's men's Tour of Flanders. Oh, it's a good one. I think in the final, I was, wow, I was surprised by De Kerning quit steps tactics or elegant quit step. Um, I mean, they had Askreen and Julian Alaphilippe in the kind of select group in the final 30k. Um, they then decided to attack with Kasper Askreen in the moments. I thought perhaps they put themselves in a slightly worse position, um, effectively allowing Askreen to go 1v1 against Van der Poel and Van Aert when I thought they may have tried to use Alaphilippe and Askreen together in the finish. But I guess, um, yeah, they're the kings of the Cobble Classics and they showed again that we shouldn't question their tactics, but they did surprise me in the moment. This is a big question, isn't it? Um, so you have riders like Van Aert and Van der Poel who are plan A's with teams who, who only have plan A's. They don't have any other option. And today, it wasn't the winning option, even though they were up there. Um, looking at the spring season at, um, kind of as a whole, like, what do we think like, is a better tactic to have several captains, like elegant quick step, as I have just remembered to call them, or um, having you know, these super leaders as Van Aert and Van der Poel really are? Ooh, it's such a difficult one because you have to say you would prefer to have Van Aert and Van Der Poel in your team rather than be going against them. However, having the numerous cards to play, I think, is really invaluable for Quick Step, Elegance, De Koenig, whichever uh, we're going to call them. But um, 
it's hard to it's hard to say you'd not rather have the the multiple cars of quick step in my opinion sending multiple riders up the roads we saw a a quick step masterclass last week at e3 where Askreen won there he's won again today but i think he was just the stronger rider today really um i don't think quick step had as big a stranglehold on the race as they had at e3 last week but yeah for me Askreen has shown how strong he is individually this week, but you can't you, you can't go up against Quick Step and expect to win. They have so many options and so many cards to play; they're almost impossible to beat on some days. And Amy, did you expect that outcome? Like especially when um, Vanderpol and and Askreen got away in the finale? No, I don't think many people did. I mean, we've been so used to seeing Vanderpol win so easily. Um, and so often, um, I mean, I think it would have been unfair to completely write off Askreen. Like he's been riding really well. He won E3, whatever it's called the other day. Um, so yeah, he's obviously really strong, but I don't, I mean, the way that Vanderpool, he didn't sit up, but he was, he kind of just conceded it to him at the very end. Um, yeah, it was pretty surprising to me. And Taylor, what did you make of kind of that last 20k and the final sprint and the surprising outcome. Yeah, I was really stoked for Askreen. I thought it was, he played it brilliantly. I mean, in the last case, staying behind uh, Vanderpool and, and really playing it cool and and waiting and, and trusting his sprint. Because I think a lot of people would probably be like, oh, he needs to attack him because Vanderpool is quicker. Um, but he really had confidence and he trusted himself and it paid off. And it was it was really cool to see that. And just the way he raced the whole race was was pretty incredible. Is Casper Askreen a Girona resident as well? I don't know, actually. I don't know. I do not Sometimes, know. maybe, anyway. I thought he might be one of yours, so it could be a victory claimed for... <laughs> There's for so that. many here that I don't even... I can't keep track of them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. <laughs> His girlfriend rides for the local team, though. Oh, cool. The Massey Tactic. Nice. We featured her, I think, last year. Um, yeah, like her name's Gabby Pilot and she's an artist. Oh, she's a really good yeah, artist. I know Gabby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's brilliant. I feel like a huge hypocrite now because I tweeted earlier about how it's irrelevant to talk about people's partners, but <laughs> I've meant it more from the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie, you're absolutely right that I really like the ending because the race was really just, un just unpredictable to the last. That's what's nice about cycling when. I even turned to my friend and said, how many lengths is Van der Poel going to win by with 1K to go? So what do I know about, well, anything, but especially pro cycling. But it's just really nice to be surprised like that. Um, so I think that kind of lifted the race and made it even more special when everyone was expecting Van der Poel to win. Yeah, I think one thing that Van der Poel may regret slightly is he seemed to be so caught up understandably so, in trying to drop Wout van Aert, who of course he did beat in the sprint last year. Um, perhaps he went a little too deep, I think, on the on the Otequamont, trying to drop van Aert, perhaps underrating Askreen's sprints a little. I'm not sure, but just the point, maybe um, he was so wrapped up in dropping van Aert that he uh, he failed to, um, to realise the risk Askreen uh, posed in a sprint. Did any of you feel sorry for Julien Alaphilippe, uh, given that last year he, he crashed out uh, spectacularly with a tangling with a motorbike? And this year he seemed to play the role of perfect teammate and watched victory ride away from him. Nah, he wins enough bike races that I don't feel bad for him. <laughs> Yeah, I think I agree. And also, I mean, his teammates still won, so it wasn't in vain. Exactly. Yeah, yeah there's more than one way of earning the rainbow stripes. Like being a perfect teammate is also kind of underrated, I think. Um, okay, well, let's let's go through kind of the winners and the losers. Maybe the losers is a bit uh, kind of better than winners. We've talked about, you know, um, elegant quick step. Who, which teams would have hoped to have had a better Tour Flanders? Well, I mean, my teammate Jasper got fourth, which I mean, he would have wanted to win, but I think fourth is still still good. But I think they maybe would have wanted some more numbers in that uh, chasing group to help him out. Or so I could say, Trek Segafredo. I think there were poorer teams, <laughs> frankly. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> who did I write down? Lotto didn't have, I think, anyone in the top twenty. 
And as a Belgian team, this is this is their biggest day of the year, really. Um, mm. They would have hoped for more. Yeah, maybe I could add Bor Hansgrohe to that. I mean, they added Nils Pullitz this off season um, to partner Peter Sagan, and perhaps they'd have been a little disappointed. I know they've had their issues. Sagan had COVID not too long ago. And I know the team haven't been able uh, to rise the full um, the full selection of cobbled Belgian races recently. So uh, maybe a bit harsh to say them, but yeah, they were they weren't there in the final. ESM didn't have anyone in the top ten. Yeah, that's right. right. Yep. <laughs> Everyone was really quiet, and I was like, "Is that wrong?" <laughs> I think Tees Benut was just at the back of the chasing group. Um, he was twelve. But they're a very young team, so I'm kind of interested in seeing what some of their riders do in the next few years as well. Um, it was, yeah, quite quite an average day for them. Um, it's probably worth remarking on the weirdness of a fanless tour of Flanders as well. What did you guys think of that? Yeah, it's a bit sad. I mean, I can say it from racing it last year. It's just not the same. You don't really have that kind of environment on all the the sectors and on all the climbs it's 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 sad not having the fans the fans out um i'm happy that they can still have the races of course but it's definitely a different um it's a different vibe we'll roll on kind of next year and hopefully everything's sorted pandemic wise um yeah. <laughs> but lastly um let's hear your unsung heroes for the men's race um amy would you like to go first well, it's quite funny because earlier on in the race, I had Askreen written down as like a potential one. Um, I mean, because he, he crashed. He did crash, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, it just looks as if he was more kind of working for Alaphilippe or, and just doing a really good job because he was always up there. So I had him written down, but obviously can't really choose the winner for that. Um, so I guess Turgis, I would say. Oh, that was mine. Uh, you <laughs> that's not mine as well. You... <laughs> Everybody else talk about that then. That's fine. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say him because, you know, he bridged at first to that group. And then even after that, did some incredible turns on the front and just kept seeing to put the hammer down no matter how hard it was. So I was really impressed with that. Yeah, he's been really consistent as well over the past the past few weeks, I think. He was on the podium at Kerner, unless I'm mistaken. Um, and he's just constantly been in the top 10, top 15. So he's been great recently. And again today, if I could add one to that, I might even go for a man who finished on the podium. So not sure if, if that's allowed. But Greg Van Avermaet, to me, he looked like he was really struggling earlier on in the race. I was watching him closely and he was struggling to hold the wheels on the penultimate ascent of the Otakwamont. So... To come away with a podium, another podium at the Tour of Flanders for him, I think he can be really happy with that. Let's move from one excellent veteran to another, um, Annemiek van Vluten, with a very impressive solo win at the age of 38 and a half. Um, I think she's the oldest Tour of Flanders winner in history, you know, men's or, or women's. Um, that was really a nail-biting conclusion, you know, all the way down to the last 2K, I think, when the gap went up. Um, for a moment, I actually thought that SD works, or, or maybe FDJ would bring it back. Uh, should, we, should we still be surprised by Van Vluten and this kind of exploit? I don't think we should be surprised because she is um, an incredible bike racer and an incredibly strong. I think her form wasn't quite um, where we have seen it in the past, like at Strada and... Um, she tried those moves where she goes on the climbs and um, Estrada, like Voss was able to stay with her and, and looked pretty calm on her wheel. So we knew she didn't quite have that snap, but then she went to altitude and um, it seemed like she was kind of narrowing in on Flanders. So definitely, definitely not surprised um, by, by the wind for sure. It's a, yeah, it's her, it's her signature thing. She loves to go solo. Taylor, you've raced with her. You've raced on, on the same team several years ago uh, mm. with, with Orica. So I, I'm just wondering uh, kind of what is she like and what makes her so phenomenal as a bike racer? Yeah, she's, I mean, she's lovely. She's a very nice person, super hardworking. Um, obviously, she's very hardworking. 
and yeah, she's just got, uh, she's just, she, she's really focused and um, that's not to say that everybody in the Peloton's not focused and works really hard. They all do, but um, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible to see what she's done just the last few years. I mean, she's always been incredible. She's been winning races for the last 10 years, but I think in the past few years, she's just kind of gone up another level. And so what was your take on the women's race, Taylor? I thought it was exciting. Um, I was super excited to see Audrey off the front, obviously, because um, she's my teammate and she works incredibly hard. I mean, I I don't know another person that works so hard for so many other riders. And um, I think if she was able to go for herself more often, she would probably um, win more races. But she she just is she's an incredible um Rider and she's our team captain and an incredible captain. So I was excited to see that. And then, yeah, obviously, just watching the racing was it was great. The the chase group behind I was a little disappointed in because I felt like I don't know. Sometimes I think they think too much about the podium and they don't really try to kind of come together to get the rider off the front. So I would have liked to see more cohesion in that group. But bike racing. That's almost exactly what we saw in in Binder as well the solo rider off the front and then the group behind just kind of like not wanting to bring a faster rider to the line if they caught the rider in front in in Binda it was Voss and today I think probably they didn't want Cavalli and Brenauer to like sprint but yeah well I was going to say kind of um, who stood out for you today Amy and who surprised you as well well actually I think I was I mean, talking about Audrey, like I was really impressed. I mean, Trek only had five riders today. Um, and considering that they put on, a re- like they had a really good race, like with Audrey um, riding off the front for so long, I think she was away for like 10 Ks or something. Um, and Elisa represented in that final group. Um, so I was impressed with them as a team. Um, and also, um, well, I'm going to save it for my unsung hero, actually. <laughs> right now, that's really impressive. Um, but otherwise, um, Marta Cavalli, I was really impressed with her to, um, to still be with that group of who were really like the creme de la creme of women's racing at the end there. Um, she's, yeah, she's a really great up and coming rider. Well, she's already there. Yeah, she's really stepped it up this year. Like she had incredible race at Strada as well. And and she took a big risk kind of attacking um, into the last like K and a half of Strada. It didn't pay off, but it was still really cool to see her do something like that. And yeah, I think she's she's one to watch. Yeah. Anything I would say in mitigation is that FTJ may be a, a bit disappointed that I think ultimately her and Utra Ludwig finished at the back of the group, which is the worst mm-hmm. place to finish when you have a numerical advantage. Yeah, I think they're probably pretty disappointed. It seems like Cavalli was sitting on, so she was going to sprint and Cecile was working. And yeah, I don't know what happened in the end with Cavalli's sprint, but maybe she just you didn't have the. Sometimes you don't know. <laughs> After that long of a race, you, you might think you can sprint and then you stand up and you can't. So you can't really fault her either because sometimes you just don't know what's left. Well, that's a perfect description of what happened to Vanderpoel, basically, mm-hmm. that he just seized up. He stopped at like 50 minutes ago, didn't he? He, he was looked done. quite quick at first, though. It was like, whoa, and then just done. Yeah, gave up. Legs gave up. Let's pause the women's race uh, and move on to Pest of the Day, where we put the spotlight on the good boys, the horses, ferrets, alpacas, whatever, at bike races, who are, of course, on leashes or in fields, not interrupting the bike race. Um, Amy, I believe you've got several for us today i have three all dogs sadly no horses or ferrets or alpacas next time um, hopefully next time um yeah i saw with 152 cases to go in the men's race there was a very good boy on the lead standing next to the road on a climb um notably tethered unable to run into the peloton um with 146 cases to go so in quick succession there was another one. Um, they were showing a helicopter shot of some like architectural site. I think it was the same time as that. And there was a good boy on a walk, just strolling along next to. You. Probably had no idea that it was a bike race, just a few hundred meters away from him. 
Um, and then in the women's race, it was a very brief, quick flash, but he looked like a golden retriever to me. And he was standing there also on a lead on the corner with 45 Ks to go. They're all so, good. No girl dogs? Come on. Well, <laughs> it's just good good boys that they could, yeah, that's true. We'll be, um, how, what, I mean, what's a term for a dog that you could, I mean. That's a true. Good, good kind of, yeah. <laughs> Really you can't really care. say that. <laughs> it isn't the watershed. <laughs> um, I'll brainstorm for a gender neutral dog term for next week. <laughs> I'm going to get in touch with these, you know, TV camera helicopter pilots because we're seeing all this great architecture and history, but not enough of these fine animals, these, <laughs> these fine specimens. So maybe in, in the next races. He'll be um, in our service for pet of the pet of the race, pet of the day. Um, <laughs> let's move on to back to humans, uh, to unsung heroes. Um, Joe, who is yours for the women's race? Well, I was going to say Marta Cavalli, but can I say that after the big section on her already? Um, yeah, I will. I will say her. I mean, sixth place today, I think, is her best performance of the classic season on paper, but. I guess putting her up there for her entire classics uh, season, she's been great. And I still think she is just 23 years old, unless I'm mistaken. So uh, she's one for the future as well as now. Um, although I must say, like like you mentioned, Andy, FDJ, as well as SD Works would have been disappointed. They had two riders in that final group behind Van Vluten and neither team made it to the podium. Uh, but nonetheless, I think Cavalli really impressive for the last few weeks I think it's worth mentioning actually as Joe says like SD works is a bit of a funny one for them like they've kind of like lost the domination that they had in the first few uh, races um and weirdly Anna she just like didn't even try and sprint at the end um maybe she thought Volering was going to go for it but she literally just like just soft tapped into the line um so yeah I don't really know what to make of that but yeah um, I think she had been working um kind of for volering um it seems like she was doing some harder pulls and um I I would say watch out for her at the Ardennes because I think she's uh she's gonna peak for those <laughs> <laughs> yeah they'll be back I'm sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> And who are your unsung uh, heroes, uh, Taylor? Uh, when I think of unsung heroes, I kind of think of, you know, teammates that are kind of giving it up um, for each other. And today I really saw Liv do that um, with, I think Soroya gave her bike to, um, uh, why did I just lose her name in my brain? Kopecky. Kopecky. <laughs> she, because Kopecky really sadly had a, had a mechanical right at the bottom of the Quermont and, Soraya, who'd been having a great race, gave her her bike. And then Allison Jackson waited for Kopecky to try to help her back. And um, I think that's, I always think that's really incredible, especially for for two riders who are super strong, still in the front group and and um, having great races themselves to to give it up for Kopecky. And I really would have liked to see what Kopecky could have done had she not had the mechanical, because she's been so strong and um I think to see her win Flanders would be pretty incredible. So I would say live, live the whole team had an amazing race, but I think those two riders, Allison Jackson and uh, Soroya just really gave it up. And uh, I think they're the unsigned heroes. And Amy, how about you? Um, kind of in a similar vein, actually, I was going to say um, Sarah Roy, because on multiple occasions, it looked like she was a goner. Um, she was getting dropped on like all the climbs and then, Time and again, she just came back and then she did a monster turn. Um, when I think she was the one that brought back Audrey eventually, um, or closed the gap down quite a lot anyway. Um, so yeah, to have to have got back on that many times and then come up to the front and done a turn like that is incredible. So yeah, I would say her. Yeah, that's a good run. Roy's a legend, and she uh yeah, she you could tell she died a thousand deaths today. <laughs> Well, well, very good picks. Um, just before we go, maybe a kind of a new franchise for us is Random Corner. <laughs> random observations from the race. Um, if anyone has any, I did spot that I'd never seen national jerseys maybe so much in the 
ascendancy uh, kind of in the classic in well, one race you had the Danish champion winning <laughs> the European champion winning in the women's race Van der Poel in the Dutch jersey or um, Audrey Cordon Rago in the French jersey I think uh, yeah but I thought it was really nice to see because they're all really nice jerseys. So <laughs> that's my random input anyway. Um, anyone else? Um, not necessarily random per se, I guess, but um, as noticed, um, Yara Castellane, um, oh God, I've just butchered that name. But anyway, um, the Planta Pura rider, um, she went back to the commissaire car and gave her a bottle so as not to like throw it at the side of the road, um, which shows good presence of mind from her because the rules only just come in. Um, and we saw some men fall foul of that. Um, so, yeah, good for her, I guess. She didn't get DQ'd. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, yeah, I meant to mention this earlier. So Michael Shaw, the very experienced uh, Citroen AG2R rider, got disqualified for, well, like ostensibly throwing his bid on to a Belgian family on the roadside, which seems extremely harsh. Like, so this is all the new rules brought in on April the 1st, April Fool's Day. <laughs> um, and it, so I think it, it has been done to stop littering and be more green. But what do we think of that application of the letter of the law in Charles' case, briefly? Uh, to be honest, I think they have to enforce it or else no one will take it seriously, unfortunately. And I, I do wish we could still hand bottles to fans, not in the time of coronavirus, because I think that's dangerous. Um, because fans do love bottles, but at the same time, I think if if the commissaires aren't really taking it seriously, the writers won't take it seriously, and and the rule won't mean anything. And <clears throat> it's killed me for years watching writers throw bottles into fields and over bridges into rivers and just garbage everywhere. So I'm actually pretty happy that they're enforcing it. It's unfortunate for him, but unfortunately, I think they kind of have to make an example out of some people so that people do take it seriously. Yeah, I think like in the case of littering, like it's obviously not I, like it's something that needs to be stopped. And you know, bike racing is probably not the most carbon friendly. Is that the right word? I don't know. Kind of sport, and to see like people chucking gels and stuff. But I think ultimately, like maybe some discretion is needed, which I guess doesn't really fit with consistency. But you know, if someone, if there's a fan right there, and he literally was like. He just gave it directly to them pretty much. And okay, yeah, like Taylor said, in the time of Corona, not ideal. But yeah, I don't know. It's part of the sport in a way as well, doing that. I think chucking it in a field and chucking it to a fan are quite different, but then it's how do you enforce it, I suppose. I'm kind of hoping that once coronavirus has passed, that they might let you know let you ch chuck it to a fan because I do think it's, it's nice for fans. There's fans that collect bottles, so... Um, I think they did do it for coronavirus, so maybe that will change in the future. Who knows? Fingers crossed. Well, thanks for joining us, Taylor and Amy and Joe. And we'll be back next week for Paris. <laughs> no, we won't be back next week for Paris Roubaix because <laughs> it's been cancelled. <laughs> Made myself sad there. But, um, we'll be back soon, probably for the Arden Classics. Uh, but thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed it, then in the words of Adam Buxton, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you soon. Bye.